Okay, welcome back to DC EKG, where we're continuing our discussion with Brian Blaze, healthcare luminary and the conservative firmament founder and CEO of Paragon Health. We have uh, emerged from the ashes of the repeal and replace disaster. You have fulfilled the president's promise to let him issue an executive order uh, to map a new direction in healthcare. And one of my uh, vivid memories of that time period, you were on the second floor, I'm on the second floor in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, the old Executive Office Building. It's a gorgeous building on the White House complex, but next to what people generally refer to as the White House proper where the president lives. So you're commanding every Thursday, uh, the, the appointed hour, uh, a, a number of different agencies and policy experts. I'm there uh, sometimes, many times, with my OMB staff, but I always have OMB staff in that room. You're leading the National Economic Council staff. Talk about what that process was, how you figured out what to do, and, and really uh, what your thought process was in marshalling all those experts around the table. Yeah, Joe, so, you know, we only had a limited amount of time and we needed to get stuff done. So we needed to come up with a better process uh, with coordination among all the entities uh, that have equity in health policy. So just think for a moment about all those entities, right? You've got the Department of Health and Human Services, and then you've got a lot of uh, agencies within HHS. So the one that we dealt with the most on these issues was CMS. Centers for Medicaid and Medicare? Centers services. for Medicare and Medicaid Services, right. You've got the Treasury Department, so there's a lot of health policy uh, provisions in the tax code. And then you've got the IRS. You've got the Department of Labor. So the Department of Labor um, has uh, you know, employer-sponsored insurance plans, and ERISA is Department of Labor, so they have huge equities in health policy. So those are the entities outside the White House. Within the White House, you've got the policy councils, so the one I was on, National Economic Council, Domestic Policy Council. You've got the Office of Management and Budget, which has a huge role in reviewing um, all the regulatory uh, uh, regulatory actions that the administration is going to take. You've got the Office of the Vice President. You've got Legislative Affairs. You've got um, uh, inter inter Intergovernmental Affairs. You've got White House Counsel, and you've got OIRA. And what you want oh, is... OIRA is the outfit in OMB, uh, the most powerful office nobody's ever heard of, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. And they clear every single regulation that comes out of the federal government, regardless of where it's, it's generated. So they have a seat at the table. And I want to back up on one thing. With it, you mentioned HHS and, and just CMS, but there's all these little offices that are showing up from CMS. CISIO and CCSQ, and you've got people from the secretary's office, the deputy secretary's office around there. So there's a whole host of characters and personalities. And this is a big room, the, di the dip diplomatic reception room, where big meetings have been held before of historical significance. And uh, it's jammed to the rafters with people. And after nine months of a failed policy process, you somehow have to get this harnessed and in order. Right. So actually, there was a, a career staffer at the Department of Labor who, in late uh, 2017, walked me through how the Obama administration ran their policy process. And that was very helpful in us setting up a more effective policy process. Really? So the one thing the Obama administration <laughs> contributed to the Trump administration was a much better policy process. It was. So because when, when you have all those entities, they need to be coordinated. So any of those entities can slow down and block action, right? So the bureaucracy moves very slowly. So you've got to have coordination, um, working together, and people with insight um, into the process. So every Tuesday at 1030 in the morning, uh, we would do a call, which was just focused on process. Who's in charge of what? Where is it? Um, and uh, and when, it, when is it going to get done? So that was um, sort of, we, we'd had a regulatory tracker. We usually on the regulatory tracker had between 10 and 15 issues that we were monitoring um, progress on. And then on Thursdays, uh, we would all meet and I would, we would, NEC would develop the agenda uh, and we would go through the agenda and we would talk through um, policy issues. And at that point, you're trying to um, hash things out and get consensus. Um, I always like to find consensus at my level, because if you didn't get consensus, then in the policy process, things get elevated. 
Um, so uh, the next level up would be the deputy uh, level. And so if, if something is not solved, it goes up there, and then deputies discuss it. If they don't find consensus, it goes to principals, which are you know cabinet secretaries, um, uh, the OMB director, uh, the chief of staff, any C director. Um, they will discuss the issue. If they don't get consensus, it goes to the president. Um, and then the president is the decider, and he, he makes a decision on, on what the action is going to be. When you move issues up, um, you are now dealing with people that understand. The, they have more authority, but for generally they understand the issue less, and you're introducing more uncertainty. So I always try to solve as much at our level as we could um, to, to minimize um, issues that, uh, uh, that ran up the chain. And on the, on the key stuff that, that NEC drove, we did a pretty effective um, uh, job on that. So we had this policy process in place to then execute on the items that were in the president's executive order. And what were those in particular? So the three items that we put in were put in to address the big losers from Obamacare. Um, people in the middle class um, that didn't have offer of coverage through their employer, and uh, Obamacare significantly increased their premiums, as well as small employers um, and their workers who were increasingly, small employers were increasingly not offering coverage. So the three elements, uh, the first one was an expansion of what's called association health plans. And these are ways that small employers can join together uh, in order to offer uh, coverage uh, and get some of the regulatory advantages and economies of scale that large uh, uh, employers receive when they offer coverage. That seems so reasonable to anybody to say, okay, uh, Boeing has got enough purchasing power, big company, tons of money. Everybody on the left and right should be able to say small businesses should be able to get together and get the same advantage for their employees. Why is it not? And this has been a fight for decades up on Capitol Hill, always putting aside this idea that small businesses could join together. So what, what's the controversy? Why do people oppose it? Um, so some people thought it was an end run around Obamacare, and um, uh, and other people thought it, the administration didn't have the authority to sort of extend the ERISA protection to these um, uh, to these associations to offer coverage. By end run, do you mean choice? If somebody's get if somebody's doing an end run around Obamacare, you're giving people you're choices. giving people options, and actually, it's a bogus argument, Joe, because employer coverage is um, uh, mostly better than Obamacare, right? It's got covers more providers, um, uh, actuarial value for employer coverage. So what the plan uh, pays uh, is higher for group plans than it is for individual market plans. So it's really a bogus argument. Um, uh, and you're right. This is like a no-brainer. We want, I mean, small businesses to get the. What? Why should they not be able to get the same health care advantages and offering coverage that large employers? So, have. if Congress isn't able to get this done, like I said, I've been trying for decades, you're able to pioneer and innovate a way to actually get this done under presidential leadership for President Trump's first term. Yep, that gets nailed. That gets done. So we um, that was the first of the three actions. Um, it was two. finalized, uh, went into effect. Many employers were taking advantage of it and offering coverage. Unfortunately, on AHPs, uh, we went to. Uh, there were several attorneys general that filed uh, litigation against the action, including the current HHS secretary. Um, and there was one federal judge who sided with them and I think used some of President Trump's uh, comments against it where he, you know, mentioned that this is, you know, alternatives to Obamacare. And I think he specifically said in his decision, he used the term end run around Obamacare and knocked out that opportunity for small businesses and, uh, and their workers. But the path to create this remains extant, even if for the moment at least Correct. court has enjoined the ability of people to, to utilize this. And that, that, that decision has been appealed, um, and because of the change in administrations, there's been you know issues around the appeal. But that, that is an issue that will come back. There's a lot of uh, Republican interest in expanded association health plans. Um, the second action was an expansion of uh, products called short-term limited duration health insurance. And um, this is a really interesting um, 
uh, sort of policy process behind this. I had not heard of uh, short-term limited duration health insurance. Chris Pope at the Manhattan Institute uh, came and uh, briefed some of us. Joe, I, you might have been in that, that briefing that he had mm -hmm. with us. Um, and he said, you know, there's these plans out there that the federal government doesn't regulate as health insurance and they don't have to satisfy all the Obamacare rules and regulations. And they're much more flexible and they're much more affordable. Um, and the Obama administration took actions to restrict these plans. What you all can do is uh, undo those restrictions. Made perfect sense to me. Like if the Obama administration was restricting a choice of health insurance coverage, uh, we should undo those restrictions. Um, until the executive order, we had problems uh, within the administration. So there were some folks at HHS that were um, reluctant to um, uh, to move this policy forward. So wait. So let's just pu push on this because I think there's two there's two key issues at play here. One. The Obama administration is restricting short-term limited duration plans just at a point where more people may be uh, choosing to purchase them. The exchanges are starting to deteriorate. The subsidies are not uh, big enough, uh, you know, the, not fulfilling their promises. The Obama administration says, holy cow, we've got to outlaw these things, restrict their ability to be sold, and thus taking an option away from people. We come in, you learn about it, <clears throat> you say, hey, why don't we do this? Again, you would think in the conservative administration and a Republican administration, the Obama administration had done it. It should have been universal to reverse it. But it revealed the fact that we weren't all on the same page as conservatives or Republicans around what to do with the exchanges. And there were plenty of people in HHS, as you said, who thought it was competition of the exchanges and they didn't want to see that, correct? Yeah. But also it underscores the value of the executive order in having a president direct agencies, departments, and the White House staff to achieve a policy outcome and give you additional ability to drive this policy process, get people aligned, and ultimately deliver results when it comes to this. That's right. Yeah. So um, so we were able to execute on that. And basically, so what the Obama administration did is they took the contract period from a year down to three months. So we undid that restriction, allowed people to purchase these plans for up to a year, really providing uh, people with a consumer protection. The Obama administration's rule, if you got sick during your three-month coverage period, uh, after that coverage period, you wouldn't lot. be able to get you right. wouldn't be able to get insurance again. You have again. to pay out of pocket for, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars of costs. I remember a leukemia patient coming in and explaining this problem to my then boss up on the hill. Absolutely the case. So this provides quality insurance, peace of mind, and the ability of people who take advantage of this opportunity to discover or find, I should say, other insurance options while they're being covered with the short-term plan. So yep. what's the third? Uh, so that rule just so that that was finalized and has been in effect for almost three years now. And the Obama or the Biden administration has signaled that they're going to reverse um, the uh, what we did to to loosen those up. But if they do that, they would take be taking away coverage, um, and they would significantly be uh, increase the number of people without health insurance. Um, the third item was the most complicated. We actually didn't even really start a lot of work on the third until the first two were finalized. It's an expansion of something called um, health reimbursement arrangements, HRAs. Uh, again, this was largely reversing uh, Obama administration uh, policies. So the Obama administration um, prevented people from using these HRAs to purchase individual market um, premiums. Um, so I should define what an HRA is. An HRA is an employer um, uh, promise to reimburse employee health care expenses. Um, one of the main policy priorities for conservatives for decades has been something called defined contribution health insurance, um, where uh, the worker would have more choice over the type of coverage. Right now, uh, most employers you know, that offer coverage only offer one or two plans to the workers. You know, what other major financial product uh, do Americans purchase where they only get one or two choices? We wanted to broaden that choice, um, give employers a new way to offer coverage. Um, it's really like the think about like 401ks, where in 401ks, uh, the employer provides the contribution and the worker decides how they want to invest for their retirement. This is the worker, the employer providing the contribution and the worker selecting the coverage that's uh, best for them. And it's integration with ACA compliant plans in the individual market. 
Um, so it was people taking employer coverage, um, a employer offer to to buy into ACA compliant coverage in the individual market. So wouldn't so wouldn't Democrats be all fired up that you're doing this? Wouldn't they be patting you on the back saying thank you? You're giving more workers the opportunity to buy ACA compliant plans, thus expanding Obamacare to some extent. I think the Democrats have just. Some of them just they, they want to they oppose everything that the Trump administration did. It is um, uh, sort of one of the major uh, uh, pieces of federal new, new rule that I worked on that hasn't been subject to litigation challenge. Um, and it's been in effect since January of 2020. So for the last you know two and a half years, employers have been able to provide workers health insurance through this through this way. And I do think it's got bipartisan lasting appeal because it is, um, uh, allowing people to buy per, buy Obamacare plans. So with this process and this executive order, you're able to p- pioneer and spearhead policies on health care that give consumers choice, that provide more options and more, more opportunity to figure out what's best for them and their families. Joe, in the meantime, you're changing jobs, coming from the OMB, entering the White House, becoming head of the Domestic Policy Council. You take this insight and this charge from the president and in your lane with your health care responsibilities, you start driving a whole bunch of innovative health policies as well. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I think Brian kind of showed the way, right? I mean, we took advantage uh, of the executive order model to get the president sold on an idea in the White House and then drive a process to and marshal uh, the agencies and departments to come along behind us. Uh, before that, I think before we figured out that this could be done, first of all, the president loved doing executive orders. So we did an executive order on something once a week uh, on some subject, energy policy, whatever. So we started to get rolling on executive orders. And in healthcare, we figured this is the only way we're going to drive consensus and drive a process. Brian blazed that. And I mean, there's two other points on this. One is by doing that first executive order with choice and competition in the title, we were always able to use that as our lodestar. We want choice and competition. Competition is is good and it improves outcomes and we want patients, taxpayers to have choices. And Brian faced a lot of resistance on that. I mean, he's being kind of kind to the process, but there were people that were pushing back on a lot of the things that he wanted to achieve. He was going too far. He was gonna destabilize uh, the exchanges, but uh, he really showed the way with his staff. So we, when I took over the Domestic Policy Council, we we had no longer could we fight, you know, repeal and replace, obviously. So what are we going to do? We're going to fight on improving people's health care. Uh, one of your former deputies, for instance, uh, uh, had gone over to HHS and came up with the idea to modernize the kidney transplant uh, program in the United States. Kidney patients dialysis patients had been complaining about this process for years and boom let's kick off we we did an executive order on the subject on a stage in dc we had people that were had had kidney transplants who were on the waiting list with the president kicked off a whole process to do that entrenched uh, agent entrenched interest the organ procurement organizations that had largely been uh, immune from reform for decades they didn't like it but the patient sure did. Right to try at the Food and Drug Administration was something we worked with the Hill on. We worked on uh, the other thing that came out of that uh, was clearing out the generic drug backlog that brought drug prices down. You had the Council of Economic Advisors doing an analysis of it and saying that drug prices uh, had come down for the first time year over year in something like 40 years. And we began to just march out going after specific individual health care programs that needed to be reformed and putting us on the side of the of patients again and again. And you rather w- than being stuck in this multi decade Democrat Republican fight over how is it the best way to expand coverage, which had been something that had consumed and gripped both parties to their benefit or detriment since the nineteen seventies. Really changed the model here based on what you laid out in the executive order and the policies that you put on the table, followed by everything that you did, that, look, the president set the goal, really kind of became a thermostat rather than a temperature gauge 
of saying we need to come up with both a better way of fighting the healthcare debate, but also delivering results for healthcare recipients, for patients, for families, for people. So in a minute, we're going to get into you uh, founding Paragon Health Institute. But before we leave this uh, segment, I just want to concentrate on one one issue that you had spent a lot of time on, and uh, which is the financing of healthcare. So not too long ago, you testified on Capitol Hill. There, you were the only Republican witness, is my recollection. There were a bunch of Democrat witnesses, and they all talked about healthcare financing, and you were talking about a whole suite of other issues. I, to my mind, watching that, it looked to me like it was full circle, the culmination of all the work that you had begun to, to figure out within the Trump administration and uh, at your new think tank that you realized, um, or really have defined, the fact that there's a lot more to healthcare than financing, which is where the Democrats are right now. Right. And the financing side is obviously uh, very important, and we want to get as much of the financing under the direct consumer control. But it is, I, w I was struck by um, the Democrat witness. I mean, if you think about a pie, they're just thinking about how do we divide the pie and pay for sort of the existing pie. And what we need to do is grow. Um, uh, grow the pie, and we need to expand and improve the supply of health care in the U.S. as well. And they don't have any, um, they didn't talk about that at all. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we started with Paragon is uh, a state health reform book and what states can do uh, to liberate providers to best treat patients, um, uh, what, what we can do to take on some of the uh, growing consolidation in healthcare markets. I mean, that's one of the reasons why uh, we focused on price transparency efforts. So there's greater, in, in the Trump administration, so there's greater awareness of price variation. So we can uh, migrate uh, uh, workers and uh, family members away from high price facilities to lower price facilities. Um, but what can we do to make more efficient um, and, and uh, healthcare? And what we can do to make sure that there's policies conducive to innovation. You know, if it's consumers spending their own money in a competitive market, that's really um, uh, goes a long way to having a uh, climate for innovation. Um, but we need to have policies uh, that are conducive to innovation and that don't strangle innovation. So what can we do on Medicare? Because Medicare um, uh, reform is fundamentally needed. A lot of these companies um, look to how Medicare, whether Medicare will reimburse what they uh, develop, uh, what that reimbursement rate's going to going to be. And Medicare um, is it's on track to a pretty significant insolvency event in just a couple of years, right? 2026. And it's got a bureaucracy that um, sets prices. And that bureaucracy listens to lobbyists and special interests um, that have a, a, a vested sort of interest in protecting the status quo. And we need to disrupt um, the status quo in American uh, health care. I mean, right. you look, well, we got to let's let's uh, stop there for this segment. And then when we return, we'll talk about you leaving the White House, abandoning me, and <laughs> then founding Paragon Health. Okay. 